Hi, everybody. Welcome again to another episode of the Shop Notes podcast. Today is episode number 117. And on today's program, we're going to be talking about uh, shop setup and the things that we often forget about. I want to thank Woodcraft Supply for sponsoring today's episode. Since 1928, Woodcraft has been providing woodworkers with the best tools and supplies. To get a free catalog, visit woodcraft.com or visit one of their 75 stores nationwide. Woodcraft, helping you make wood work. So today's topic for the podcast is inspired by a listener and viewer of the TV show. Randy wanted to know how big our shop was for the TV show and Mm. whether he could build his shop around those parameters. Which like opens up our, several our cans TV of worms. Show. The yeah, TV, TV show, show set. set. Our TV show. Yeah. Okay. It only has three walls, so really it's like infinitely big. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's an open air shop. Yeah. yeah. So, no, I'd say, is it a little bit bigger than a two car garage, do you think? Oh, yeah. It's, and I, like, you know, when we, moved in, when we moved into the space, I didn't remember how big it was because we measured it like five or six times. Because yeah. when, when we brought the walls back up, but uh, so anyway, I measured it. It's thirty six feet wide from cleanup mm-hmm. center to our new annex over on the other wall with the kind of where we do all of our turning and some of our other mm-hmm. stuff. Mm-hmm. And then it's twenty five feet deep, which is a yeah. good size. Yeah, and you lose you lose that scale when there's no fourth wall there. Mm -hmm. Sure. I would say if you're not trying to fit a bunch of TV cameras in your shop, you could probably go like 25 by 25. It (laughs) saves some room. But if you're going with the TV cameras, go the full 36 feet. Yeah. But if somebody did a 36 by 25 building and it was dedicated for a shop, you would not be dissatisfied, I don't think. Right. I think you would fill it up fairly quickly. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, no, I, I mean, but like like nature, workshops things. abhor a, vo- a vacuum. So yes, mm-hmm. yes, I would definitely say if you have a table saw, um, don't make it sixteen by sixteen because it makes it really hard to run eight foot boards through your table saw. I can see that because you're going to hit a wall one way or the other. Yeah, or planers or anything. Sure. So, yeah, but I think our, yeah, our shop would definitely be a good, uh, a really good size for a home enthusiast. Yeah. Especially if you, you know, you had the wherewithal to be able to build your own separate building. Mm -hmm. Whereas I have a building that's smaller than that, but also houses two cars, a raft of bicycles and 4,000 balls. Mm Mm-hmm. Plus my workshop. The, yep. The one thing that I would be interested to see is if we re- rearranged our TV shop uh-huh. to not take into account camera placement and stuff. How we would each change it? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Because sure. we have we have some particular tools set up in certain areas, and they sit in certain areas simply for the fact that we have to get cameras around them to shoot. Mm -hmm. So like there's, there's things I would change. Like I don't care if it's up against that wall. I would probably move that and do the joint or planer up against the wing of the table saw. Cause then they share the same space and that would maybe Mm -hmm. move to the center of the shop. You know, I would, I would change some stuff like that. Um, but there's considerations we have. Yeah. Right. You know. And like I mentioned, we only have three walls. So if we had that a fourth wall in a shop, there would be stuff on the other side of the shop. Right. Or maybe that would just be more of where um, like lumber storage would be because we don't really have that on set of, of what a normal mm-hmm. like shop would have of as far as lumber storage. Yeah. So. And I think part of what intrigued me was because like the, the basic – question is interesting like he saw our shop you know that we have on the show in our videos and there is 
I mean, even now as I'm looking over it, there's a lot of open floor space on it, which is definitely appealing. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then when I thought about it some more, like it is kind of interesting to think about like what goes in, in a shop. Cause I, when I responded to him, you know, the easy answer is like, it's 36 feet by 25 feet, but you know, like we don't have a dust collector in the space. Mm -hmm. It's just offset in a, another room, so to speak, even though we're all in one room. And we also, like John said, we don't have, uh, lumber or plywood storage in this footprint either. But again, with yep. that fourth wall put in there, suddenly there's space for that. I yeah. think, I mean, unless you go super crazy yeah, or you have a bandsaw mill, mm -hmm. mm. just saying. Yeah. yeah. I think the, now, the two things you just mentioned are probably the, the things that people don't necessarily consider in the footprint when they're thinking about a shop is like, oh, I got to get all these tools, but they didn't think about the dust collector or col dust collection or cleanup or right or that, or that kind of thing, or, or maybe the amount of materials that you're going to end up having to store and organize and ac accumulate over time. So, yeah. But. Now let me ask you guys this. If you were to build a you know, shop that size, a 25 by 36, something like that. Mm -hmm. Would you guys put a garage door on it? I would just, I mean, it's nice having a huge door to get, get like stuff in and out. So you're not like sure. trying to squeeze stuff out of the door. But the other thing on that is like when you're building a large piece of furniture, it's like, oh yeah, I can get this out of my garage, but I didn't consider getting it into a house that has a you know, certain size door or hallways yeah. that, you know, have to turn corners and stuff. So, but it is nice to, to just load and unload stuff through a, a large garage door. Yeah. And I would do it would as a single, feel? I would do it as a single garage door. If I would, okay. if I were to build a building that large. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cause it would just, and whether it would be a garage door or, you know, like a carriage door or something, you know, where it's a double door that just opens yep. out, you know, not does, yeah. it doesn't necessarily have to be a full on remote control garage door sort sure. of thing, yeah. but, and, and it's just nice to have even for like climate control when there's nice days to be able to open it all up or for clean out just to yeah. blow everything out and, or open it up and get some fresh air or yeah. whatnot. Well, and that, that, that's kind of where that question stems from is, you know, we talk about me building shop. I'm trying to decide whether I put a garage door in the shop section or not. Um, the one thing I don't like about garage doors, and we have found the, the scenes here in the old editor shop, garage doors eat up a lot of space. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, they eat up a lot of wall real estate that I don't know that I would really want to give up. Yeah. True. Well, that's why I would say to do it as a single, you know, or, yes. you know, if you could build it, you know, if you're going to build like a carriage door yourself then it wouldn't have to be quite that large, but still big enough. Like you could get large, like John was saying, get large projects out easily, load materials, and also have yep. the proverbial, you know, especially around, you know, if you're in a place that gets a winter, when you get yeah. those first couple of warm spring days where it's like door is open and I'm kind of working outside today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and, I do you think do you guys think a set of French doors is a substitute for a garage door? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so. Because that's what we have in the the shop here, and it's nice to open those up, and and yeah. it's pretty functional as far as getting uh, lumber in and out or projects in and out if we need to. I mean, it's right. Plenty of big and. Yep. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And that so anyway, I was also thinking like. You know, you know, we talked about and having lumber storage or a dust collector, and this pertains to you, Logan, I think, is like, what are the things that people are liable to overlook in planning a shop space? Because I think it's really easy to look at a space and, you know, like, this is where the table saw is going to go. This is where my workbench is going to go. And you have like those, those big pieces that are going to occupy your time in the shop, but then you're going to forget something like, oh, what do I do with the air compressor? 
Yeah, I, I would say the ones that I'm thinking about that I think are overlooked is air compressor location, dust collection location. If you could put those in separate room, I think you're, you know, better off. Mm-hmm. Right, um, but you still have to factor them in. You do, yes. You have to factor them in somewhere. I'm probably, I'm thinking I'm probably going to stick them outside the shop in the cold storage area. Um, so that's kind of what I'm thinking, just to keep noise and stuff out there, especially mm-hmm. if I'm trying to do some filming and stuff inside the shop, which is my plan. Outlets, I think, are one of the most overlooked things. Everybody talks about it, but then I don't think people give themselves enough outlets. Yeah. Even after talking about it, like, bro, go every go every four feet. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like, it's not that much more to add that extra outlets. Like, if you're mm-hmm. starting, it is if you're retrofitting a shop. But if you're building a shop from scratch, the walls are open. Yeah. Give yourself outlets. I mean, you're pulling the wire anyways. You're going to add extra two feet per outlet mm-hmm. of wire. And, ugh, yeah, give yourself outlets. And, in my opinion you're best off giving yourself a couple outlets in the ceiling as well. Hmm. Okay. You know, for hanging, for hanging air cleaners, uh, right. for retractable, you know, extension cords, stuff like that. Uh, yeah. yeah. I just, I think you can't overlook that. I was also thinking then, one other thing that would be, that's, you know, like building your own shop is, is one avenue a lot of folk are trying to cobble together space from what's already Mm -hmm. existing in their house and i ran into this in my shop when i first set it up you know because you get it set up and well you usually set up a shop twice once in your head and then once in real life and when i had my space in the garage set up the first time and i started building some stuff i quickly realized that one thing that i had overlooked is where does the project go as you're working on it? Mm-hmm. You know, cause you know, I use my workbench for a lot of hand work and it's my primary assembly surface, but then, you know, most projects, if they're a decent furniture scale are going to have sub assemblies or casework and then drawers and doors and all that kind of where does all that go while you're working on it and that's the video studio <laughs> <laughs> well yes. that's it's something that's just easily forgotten or not considered is if i'm working on a piece or the kinds of pieces that i want to make in progress they have to be sitting somewhere in order for me to continue working yeah yeah because the workbench is not the ideal spot because you're working on other project parts. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, so I'm a huge fan, and this was, this is by happenstance that uh, we have during our process of scaling down our offices, we got rid of our large photo suite. Okay. Uh, and our photo suite is a, it was just a big white piece of melamine on a, on a big rolling cart that we used to take photos of stuff on a white background. Yeah. And we, we, let the shop guys adopt this cart and this this massive cart is a laminated surface right it's probably two layers of plywood with a laminated surface on it a piece of plastic laminate that is a fantastic assembly surface and if you go in the shop that's where people's projects sit as they're getting worked on and i think having a large assembly table i'm gonna i'm gonna call it an assembly table now mine in my shop right now is also my outfeed table so it's not the best spot for it or not not the best utilization of what i have currently but i think a large assembly table like that would be perfect now it's probably going to do double duty in most people's shops because most people don't have the room that's a big part it's probably five foot by ten foot right it's like the size of a basketball court yeah yes um but it would probably do double duty in most people's shops, like standing table or, you know, you know let's call it a clamping table. Um, right. I really like that idea, and I like how it has functioned in our shop in the office. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking about I'm, – I'm designing a project in my head as we speak now. All right. Like thinking of, like – a work be- and we kind of had this in the photo studio with that one workbench that has a like small like assembly cart underneath of it 
uh, you know what I'm talking about? The the blue, no. the wall, oh, the yes. wall unit. Yeah, the one wall workshop. Little, I mean, yes. a really low it's an assembly thing, yeah. but like a a workbench that's all open underneath, and then it's got a like full size cart kind of just underneath that that pulls out and can be you know your assembly table, but it's tucked away when you so you don't have two full size workbenches at all time that they're kind of tucked underneath each other. So you have your workbench and then yeah your assembly cart underneath mm-hmm. of, so you got then you can pull it out for two work surfaces and fill all of those up with just stuff on the top all the time yes. right like more flat surfaces like ours currently are right now yeah mm-hmm. i remember yeah. there's a i have no space for it in my workshop but i've always loved it is uh shop notes long ago did a an assembly table cart that mm-hmm. was adjustable in height like you pulled these different yeah. pins out and you could raise it up and it had two flip up wings. Sure. Um, and it's just a great concept because, you know, depending on the project, if you're doing an assembly, doing the assembly on your bench is ridiculous because I'm not minute bowl, you know, I'm just not that mm-hmm. tall. It's, yeah. it's, it's the wrong height and working on sawhorses is okay sometimes and usually the way i go just because of the shape of my shop but it would be nice to have it on wheels where you can just turn the cart around and work mm-hmm. on something else rather than having to constantly circle around it like sharks in the water or something yeah okay. i think that in a perfect world and i think in you know, if you if you sit and think about a project, I think you can maybe get away without having an assembly surface if you get all your parts done to a point. I mean, you're probably going to have side. Maybe you could say if you pre finish stuff, get stuff already. Maybe you could get away without one, or have enough of a work surface on your workbench that you could get your assemblies done, get all your parts done, put together what needs to be put together, and then put the rest of the project together on your workbench without having to make more parts. I don't know that that's feasible, really, now that I'm thinking through it more. Yeah, because I'm thinking like... My mouth is running faster than my head. Right, like, you know, (laughs) when you do drawers and doors on a project, you kind of need the Mm -hmm. whole thing. I mean, I guess you could dry clamp it and fit parts like that and then disassemble, but that just feels like a lot of... Excess steps. Yeah, a lot Mm -hmm. of back and forth. Which, if that's the way you got to go, then that's the way you got to go. But the other thing that yeah. I was thinking about as an overlooked area would be like a space for metalworking. Yeah. Yes. It's good to keep that stuff separate from your woodworking. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I don't know if that's something that everybody does. You know, like, you know what I mean? Like, there, I don't know that that is something I would say every woodworker needs a... a distinct metalworking area everybody has cut bolts at some time right right and i guess that's what i'm thinking of like short yeah and i'm thinking even if it's just you know because i think of my metalworking space is a small vice stand you know logan you built one very similar and it basically just is a place where i can use my hand crank grinder to (laughs) grind chisels or you know you're cutting off a bolt or you're modifying a hinge or Yep. You know, cutting a piece of brass with a hacksaw to create a connector or a tab or yeah. whatever. Somewhere where all the metal shavings can go without getting buried in a project part when you lay it down. Right. Or mm-hmm. the various, you know, oil based fluids that are associated with metalworking. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's fair. I mean, I always. <laughs> Right now, I mean, uh, yeah, my vice stand is in my shop, and I do cut stuff down there. But I like the idea of having that stuff in my garage versus my shop. Sure. Now, does that mean that I'm I'm, I'm lazy? So I'm gonna go uh, if I'm in my shop. I'm just gonna clamp it in something and cut it there, anyways. Mm-hmm. Uh, but theoretically, I like having that stuff, like you said, separate. But I would be then keeping that in the garage with like my grinder, my welder, all that stuff is in the garage. Right. So, 
Yeah, and you definitely have to consider you know. like what's your, you know, because I try to do even though my garage shop is pretty small. Uh, I still want to have a metalworking station out there because it's the metalworking that's in service of the woodworking projects. Yes. Though yeah. I have it in a place that's kind of like the transition between like where my woodworking area and the garage area is. So when I am, you know, filing my garden shovels, it's not that weird to just clamp it in that vise and run the files across, you know, that sort of mm -hmm. thing. Or if I'm doing something with a car and need to, you know, grind something yeah. or whatever. So, but yeah, normally I'm kind of a, I really like to keep the home improvement repair maintenance shop sort of stuff away from my woodworking shop. I want to thank Woodcraft Supply for sponsoring today's episode. Since 1928, Woodcraft has been providing woodworkers with the best tools and supplies. To get a free catalog, visit woodcraft.com or visit one of their 75 stores nationwide. Woodcraft, helping you make wood work. Now, in that, in that spirit, let me ask you, this might be me. I don't know. Do you guys have one of those little plastic fold out things with tools in it and that's your like home improvement type stuff? Like, no? Okay. Phil's face is telling me that's just me. Like a toolbox? Well, I, I mean Well you mean like a what it is clamshell it, kind of Yes, yeah, like the clamshell. I bought it at Kohl's for nineteen forty five. Oh and, yeah, and it has a pink hammer, a pink okay. screwdriver, right? The father's yeah. the Father's Day toolkit. Yes. Yeah. No, yeah. I do not have yes. that. So I don't. Oh my that. gosh! So I have like this is like true confessions now. I have one of those in my. It's in my kitchen. It's it's in one of our cabinets. The kitchen. Anytime I have to change batteries, anytime I need a stupid set of pliers for something, I have thousands of dollars of tools downstairs mm -hmm. two like eight stairs away i go for the pink clamshell thing and yeah that's what i use i it's like kids kids toys need new batteries that's what i'm getting down all right yeah yep. and i have a place in the basement right off the laundry room where i keep all of the kind of repair tools and you know the little I have a bin that has like the little eyeglass screwdrivers because that's what you need to use to open up kids toys to put batteries in and yeah. that kind of stuff. And I also have separate totes for, you know, like your electrical stuff and your plumbing supplies yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I did that last summer when I was trying to make room for lumber and stuff. And I'm like, I was just sick of everything being all over. I, I did the same thing. I did like an electrical tote, a plumbing tote, a drywall tote, a flooring tote. Hmm. So I got all these totes that it's, it's very convenient, especially when I remember to put stuff back in them. Yeah. So I don't know. And then I was also thinking like, would I actually, if I had the inclination and the space, would I want a shop this large for myself? And, and that's a hard one. It is because I've just gotten used to working in very small spaces. So I would feel like I would have half of the space as my workshop and the other half would be like a racquetball court or something, or I don't know. Cause it just is you know, like when I look at our shop right now at the studio set and yes, it's a studio and we use it that way, but we also use it as a shop and it has all the tools that we need. Mm -hmm. There's a miter saw and it, I mean, we have two floor sanders, a big disc sander and an edge sander in the space. And there's a humongous lathe and plenty of storage. Yeah. So I was gonna, I was gonna ask you guys, is there anything you guys would add to our, if that shop was your shop, is there anything you would add to that tool wise that we don't have? There's one thing I would add and that's it. Oh yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, potato saw, but that doesn't matter. <laughs> That's being pompous. Yeah. If yeah, I you have were to have two table any... saws. Yeah. If I were to add anything, I think I would take out the lathe 
and since we're totally operating in a dream world here, I would put in some kind of a slot mortiser. Okay. See, I would add a drum sinker. Or oh, like, oh, like uh, a thickness like sander. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A thickness sander. Yeah. yeah. Yep. I would I would add one of those because that thing is I don't use it every day, but when you use it, it's invaluable. Yeah. You know, it's like it. Yeah. Sanding it erases all the sins. Yeah, and I would. That's in the one past, thing I always run into I the other shop to thought use. Thought that it was a totally luxurious, superfluous tool that a person does not need to have. However, I would still categorize it as that. right. Yes. However, but watching people like Dylan and Mark and John even using that, it's like, oh, that's how that works, and it's genius. Mm -hmm. I would almost have I would I, almost have one of those before I would have a jointer. Mm, mm. Okay, I I understand where you're coming from, but that doesn't mean I like it. right. But that's why we do this. <laughs> like, yeah, no, and I I I get because you can get away without a jointer. Especially if you are if you if you're just jointing the edges of boards, you know, hand plane, no issues. If you are trying to flatten the face of a board, you can get that done with a planer by making light passes or a hand plane or shimming or whatever. Yeah. Um, and that's where I'm thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Now I think are there are like very specific types of tasks in the shop that that thickness standard is almost a necessity. If you're doing bent laminations um, and you're resawing stuff, you're trying to get resawing and laminations to thickness, that thing's perfect. But, you know, that you like, yeah, you can trade that for anything. Yes, you can send them through a planer with a sled. Not the same. Uh, same thing with doing something like uh, uh, bent laminations. Uh, if you're doing like veneer work and you were making your own veneers, that would be perfect for yeah. it. Um, but yeah. Although our building supervisor Kurt said that he he uses his sander. He bought. Uh, we had a big. I don't know if it was two headed sander. That big Supermax. Super oh head. yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, I don't remember if it no, had it two didn't. heads in it or if it just had I one. I think it was. Oh, okay. So it just had one. Yeah, I don't remember now. Yeah, but that one was a big, Anyways, big one. Um, yeah, and he said he uses that. He prefers to use that over his planer. Really? Yeah, which I thought was kind of. Seems like a lot of dust. Right. And feels like a lot of, like you'd burn through a lot of sandpaper with that. Yeah. But that's, uh, that is, that is the one thing that I would add in there. I was going to say is, would you keep the jointer planer combo? Yes, I would. I think. I say this with hesitation because yesterday I was at the Oregon Woodwork uh, the Oregon Woodworkers sure. Guild. They had a sixteen inch Oliver jointer. Wow. And I have never lusted over a tool like I lusted <laughs> over that one. <laughs> like You would need like two like, men I, and a boy though to like you know, because I'm thinking like some of the slabs that you work that you saw you could theoretically run over yes. the jointer, but oh, you absolutely could. But you need a you, yeah, you, you need, need a like, basketball you need team, a, a Clydesdale to pull it. Yeah, you need a Clydesdale to pull it as people are pushing yeah. down on it. Like, yeah. but it is it was awesome. So, you know, hypothetically in a dream shop, I'm going to have a massive, absolutely ridiculously massive jointer and a planer that came from the railroad that was like 38 inches <laughs> wide you know like dream shop come yeah. on um but i think for most shops yes i would keep the jointer planer combo okay because 
the capacity on the jointer is really, really nice. Oh, yeah. It. Yeah. Um, and the, my biggest issue with them is the dust collection on the planar side is not the best. Um, yeah, I can see that. But unless... And I'm, I'm only, and this is what the kind of the fun part of talking about setting up a shop is because there's so many things where you really want to be, mm -hmm. you know, like this is what it's got to be, but it's so subjective on the types of stuff that you do. Like I've, I oh, very yeah. rarely oh, need yeah. to have an hour long planning session. So Correct. most of the time I'm just planning a couple of boards. So if the dust collection is slightly inadequate, is it that big of a deal? No, it just is like a couple more minutes with a broom. But is that more valuable than having the floor space saved because it's two machines in one? Which I think right. It is. Oh yeah, I I would take that trade off. Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah. But you know, I they don't make them anymore, and I know that there is a certain cult following around it because I would actually. Even if I had the space, I don't know that I would go back to having a table saw. Okay. Um, I, even though I, I don't, I don't disagree. Even though that, I, yeah. I, we have them here and I use them, so I'm not morally opposed to the table saw. So don't get that that on there. But um, it would just be nice to have that footprint cleared up for other stuff. However, mm -hmm. that being said. Like the old Inca tools, like they used, they made a, a, a jointer planer. It was kind of a bench top ish sized tool, but the, you know, mm -hmm. that was a, and they're still pretty highly regarded or followed or, and then they also had a table saw, but the table saw had, cause it was a tilting top table saw and the Arbor came out the side yep. and had a slot mortiser on it. So it's this compact, cute as a button kind of tool. Yep. And I would use it, you know, I just like that concept of the slot mortiser. Because I know, uh, no offense to like the multi-router, panto router, even the router jig that I'm in, still in the process of making is, will do the job of a slot mortiser. However, at its heart is still a router which even though I love using routers, yes. if I can minimize the amount of times that the screaming happens, I will do that. You know, and a sl yes. so a slot no, mortiser on these tools is only running like 35 to 4,500 RPM, much quieter tool mm -hmm. and still doing the job. So that's, that would be my dream for that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and we've talked before, like there was a Roblin that came for sale Right. In Des Moines. It was several years yeah. ago when Vince was still here. And I, I, I'm kicking myself for not buying it. I didn't have the room for it. They have plans to build the yeah. shop then. But one of those big five in ones, one of the big old good American cast iron five in ones or Canadian cast iron yeah. ones, you know, like those are sweet. Yeah. You know, now again at the Oregon Woodworkers Guild, they had a Felder sliding table saw, which was. Awesome. The, like, yeah, and I say that about table saws, but I've seen huge, people though. using those sliding table saws, and it's like, that's super cool. That would be the only thing probably that it would is. get me back into using a yeah. table saw is having one of those big freaking sliding. It, it was massive, though. Like, you could not oh, yeah. do that in a one-car garage because right. you had all these arms that, like, they all slide out as you're pushing it and stuff, but it got it was cool. Yeah. One of our former designers here, Kent Welsh, uh, like for real found one in a barn. Ah. And, and I think his is, his is, it's the sliding table saw, but it's the sliding table saw five in one. So sure. it's the jointer, planer, shaper, ah, that's sliding table saw kind of thing. Yeah, that's awesome. And so he yeah. fixed it up and that's really the centerpiece of his custom furniture business. You know, like he's yeah. got a, he's got a bandsaw and a drill press, I think are his only two other main power tools, unless sure. I'm misreading his, his feeds, but, um, yeah, but yeah, that's awesome. So, and I think I've, I think I've talked about this, but I have this weird like desire, not right now, but when I, 
get to a point in my life where I'm not working, aka retired. Um, I have this weird fascination with getting one of those like little prefab sheds. Okay. You know, like like the like around here, it's the you know the, the Amish made shed. You buy them for three thousand dollars. It has a front porch and a bunch of windows, and it's like a little yeah. tiny cabin basically. Yes. But I want one of those, and I want to just turn it into a turning studio. And I okay. would just be a, a hobbit. I'd bury that thing inside of a hill, put a round door on it, and be a turning hobbit, and it would be fantastic. Okay. Uh, but I, I like the uh, – philosophically, I like the idea of just trimming everything down, having my turning stuff in one of those. That's all I have is my turning stuff. Um, but I don't know how how feasible it is. Now, I say that with Bill Carter's basically working out on one of those making his hand plates. So – Right. Yeah. I've always been fascinated by, and he totally does work that I don't, but I appreciate his shop, uh, Curtis Buchanan in Tennessee, yeah. where it's essentially a small cabin like that. And yep. he's got a front porch on it. So yeah. when the weather's nice, he's out on the front porch and he's making Windsor chairs. Sure. And I don't see myself doing that day in and day out, but having that flexibility or a compact space that's homey and welcoming enough mm -hmm. to, to do that. Yeah. I could definitely see, uh, yeah, a work, the workshops at bag end. Oh yes. Yes. That and, would be, you know, that would be super cool. Yeah. And Which it, is why I would probably back. eschew going to a, a humongous shop is to yeah. having kind of a small, fun space where somebody walks in and is like, I've seen the stuff you make and you make that in here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, going back to talking about stuff that's not thought about, um, in shops, window placement. And that what, what I'm getting at is those little things always have these windows in them. Those little, right. um, cabin type things always have windows. I think windows are something that people don't really give much thought to where I don't, not necessarily windows, because I think people understand and people have heard that everybody talk about, oh, you need natural light, you need as much light as you can, you need windows. Uh, and this is coming from somebody whose father, my dad, is very against windows in a shop or in a garage because he has this weird theory that, I mean, and it, I mean, it, it's valid, but he thinks that's a, that's an entry point for burglar, right? Oh, Somebody's yeah. going to break through your window and rob you. Or they can see what you have. Like, And I, I understand that, but... I will take that risk for the light and the ability to open up windows for ventilation. Right. However, placement of those windows, I think, are extremely important. Yes. You know what I mean? Making sure that they're placed in areas where they're not going to interfere with tools that you're using. Like, you don't want to put your drill press in front of a window. That's goofy. Don't do that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you put your you put your router table in front of a window that's lower than the window, but um, you know yeah. we always talk to, people always talk about making sure your your workbench is against the south facing window so you get all the natural raking light across your workbench. I mean, I'm not going that nuts, but yeah, yeah, no, and I would uh, I was thinking you know our old old video studio we had the back shop where we used to make props. I always loved the windows in that space yep. because they were, I mean, I don't even know how that building was built that way, but there was, there were three sets of windows, like they were paired windows, mm -hmm. but they were taller and set lower to the ground or to the floor so that mm -hmm. it just felt like it was a really light filled space. And I would love yes. that in my shop. Also, I would love to have a wood burning stove. Totally impractical. Yeah. My insurance company is currently hating on me right now, but I think that would be super cool. I would just love it. Yeah. And these are all things that are like going into my thought process building this shop because you know, I know that I need to throw the nose and trying to figure out where to place and to work to Israel, whatever. Um I just did get stumps ground yesterday, so like we're ready for the dirt that I got delivered to all get moved into place. So progress but um although i know jim's listening i haven't got his electrical bid yet so jim i need my electrical bid um stumps ground but, i think is a pacific northwest coffee shop right I, yeah, yes 
that's fantastic. Uh, <laughs> but no, I uh, I'm trying to figure out what to do with heat. And I know I know Nelson's listening to, and he keeps telling me in floor heat. I get it. I know. I know. But something about me, just like you, Phil, really likes the ambiance of having a wood burning stove in the shop. Yeah. Like, I just really like that idea. Now, I think the shop I'm planning is probably going to be. I don't think there's a wood burning, like, pot belly stove that's going to heat that entire space. Right. Um, so I think I would need one with a blower on it, which is more of like a, a wood burning furnace that has a, an air blower or air handler that shoots the air out. Right. Uh, but. But. I mean, you're going to want to condition that space anyway. So it would be like, yes, I would want it's because this is totally our, I want a pony dream world. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would probably still have a mini split in there with the wood burning stove. For supplemental. Yes, absolutely. Yes, because I then, because so then in the summer, I'm not constantly raining sweat on my projects. Yes. And yes. in the winter, you know, the wood burning stove would be perfect in the in between seasons mm -hmm. and kind of the ambiance in the, mm -hmm. in the, in the deep winter where you could just use it to just keep things rolling along. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and would probably and... make me better at getting rid of small scraps instead of hoarding them. <laughs> That's fair. That is fair. Um, now, I will say my fear is if I do a wood burning stove or wood burning furnace. Now, I yeah, you're right. I have to have some form of conditioning for air, you know, air conditioning, and so there's going to be something else in there. Um, probably a mini split or a series of mini splits. Um, my fear would be that if you have a shop that has water pulled to it, you always need to make sure that that ambient air stays above freezing. Right. You don't want your lines to freeze. So yeah. that's the bigger thing that I am kind of like, yeah, I need to make sure that doesn't happen. Yeah. So, you know, it's one of those things. So. Yep. Always fun stuff when we talk about setting up shop. And I think that's probably the one reason that the topic is so popular. And oh, it's, yeah. it's interesting because it's really popular with people who already have workshops. Well, and I think it is because it's like, it's like a house. Once you have owned a house or two, you know what you want in a house. Right. Oh yeah. And once you have owned a shop and set up a shop and worked in the said shop, you know what you want in a shop. <laughs> Like, you right. know, you can identify what you don't like about your current shop. You can identify what you do like, and you say, hey, next time I would do it this way, or this sounds like a great idea. I'm going to do it that way. And then you do it that way, and it's like, mm -hmm. okay, that didn't work how I thought it was going to work. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, as woodworkers, we're also very aspirational, you know, because we're building projects. But, you know, we want that shop space to be inviting and a place mm -hmm. where it's fun to be in that space. You know, it's not, it's not a, it's not a place of employment for most of us, mm -hmm. yep. you know, so it's not a job site to sort of yeah. speak, you know, it's like, like Chris says, it's a little bit, it's, it's sanctuary. Yeah. Yep. But, you know, the one thing that I am most excited about building a shop is getting a shop cat. All right. Not, not going to lie. Like, and I did a, so a couple of years ago for Woodsmith, I wrote a pets in the shop article. Right. And took a certain amount of heat on it. I did. Well, okay. So, and let me explain this because lurking, and I don't know how much our listeners are on social media or Facebook, Instagram, people have their pets in the shop all the time absolutely all the time i don't know how often i see i mean daily i see 
pictures of people's shop companions. You know, it's their dogs, like laying in shavings, right. or their you know their cats on their workbench, or their goat on their workbench. You know, like people have their pets in their shop all the time, and that's great. So I wrote the article kind of as a slow your roll, protect your pet, kind of <laughs> was kind of what what the I mean, yeah, there was some goofy stuff in there, like you know, hey. Here's earmuffs for dogs. That's a real thing. Right. Um, you know, that's that's a little silly to put your earmuffs on your dogs. But like, hey, make sure they have a spot they can go that is, um, you know, maybe covered in moving blankets so it helps deaden some of the noise, or they're not breathing in dust or whatever. You know, just like be a responsible pet owner. Right. Um, and oh yeah, oh people hated it. Like I got so many emails from veterinarians and. You know, just people saying, what is, you know, what are you doing? Like, well, people should not have their pets in the shops. Like, well, yeah, I get that, but people do. Right. right. So, yeah. It's, you know, it's one of those things. Uh, but, yeah, I'm a, I have always wanted a shop cat. I tried to get us a shop cat when we moved into the video studio. Um, but I think because it's an outbuilding, I want a mouser. There you so, go. Right. I was trying to convince me to get a shop snake instead, and I said that's a terrible idea. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm gonna go with like the barn cat model. Get a get a spayed okay. or neutered barn cat, and um, let him hang out in the shop, and put a little kitty door in, and let him let him catch mice. Okay, so, bring it on. And I was just I was think I was thinking that because um, I have heard I have a friend that has a he he basically has a large large machine shed shop. It's actually a, like a, uh, a, a processing shop, a butcher shop. Um, he does it for friends and family and stuff, but it's a, it's a Morton building finished on the inside heated with a wood furnace. So one of them, you put the wood in and it has a, it looks like an actual furnace or those air. Right. Uh, he has a problem with mice Yeah. because he brings in the, those IBC totes, those big, you know, 250 gallon water totes. They come in, like aluminum or galvanized steel cages. Right. He takes the water tote out and throws his wood in there. And then he use, just uses his tractor to put that IBC tote full of wood inside the shop and throws wood in there. Right? Yeah. Thro throws wood in the, in the, uh, uh, furnace out of that. Well, he always brings mice inside. So, because they're always living in the split wood and stuff. Yeah. So I'm thinking if I'm going to be heating a shop with wood, I'm going to be, I'm going to have a mouser. So pretty excited. Okay. All right. I think that wraps it up for another episode of the shop notes podcast. We would love to hear your thoughts on either your current shop or your dream shop. Um, what you would add or take away. What are the things that you would think are essential or non-essential parts of a shop that people often have are you more of a minimalist small shop kind of a compact person uh or would you have like separate spaces for power tools and hand tools and all that kind of thing you can email us woodsmith at woodsmith.com or you can leave a comment on our youtube channel where you can also see where we're going with this episode uh, i'm going to put a couple of links and some ideas for shops on our show notes page you can check that out at woodsmith.com slash podcast want to thank Woodcraft Supply for sponsoring today's episode. Since 1928, Woodcraft has been outfitting woodworkers and their shops with everything woodworkers want. Whether you're looking for the world's best tools or the most amazing wood for your next project, Woodcraft has been helping you make wood work for more than 90 years. Visit woodcraft.com or one of their more than 70 no stores nationwide. Then go make something cool. And we'll see you next time on the Shop Notes podcast. Bye, everybody.